This is flip mini lecture number 36, and I'm going to cover night 13.5 and 13.6. And the first subject is the work done by gravity, the work done by gravity on an object. Well, let's kind of recall the way it was before when it was so simple. It used to be so simple. If you had an object of mass little m and you had this little g constant, which was 9.8 meters per second squared, and you knew that always pointed downwards. And so if you had an object, maybe you measured its height using some y-axis here. If you had an object and say it started here and it ended up up here, so from y initial to y final, then the work done by gravity, every time you took a little step upward, was opposing the direction of motion. So all these little delta y's, delta y, delta y, delta y, delta y, delta y, they each of them was going in the opposite direction of the force of gravity. So each of those little uh, elements of work was minus mg delta y for each of those little steps there. Now, if you add all that up, it just becomes the grand total of all the delta y's, and the grand total of all the delta y's was y final minus y initial. So this became minus mg y final minus y initial, which says if you throw something up, it slows down. Of course, if y final is less than y initial, that means if an object is going down, then gravity does positive work. And yeah, as something going down, it speeds up thanks to gravity. Okay, so that was your formula for the work done by gravity. And from that formula, from that formula and the fact that we want w to equal minus delta u, which is equal to minus u final minus u initial, from that, we said, oh, well, we can pick u final as a function of y to be, we can pick u as a function of y to equal mgy. And then when you plug in y final and y initial into this formula, then you get the right amount of work. Okay, that's a quick refresher on the work done by gravity on an object. Why did I do that? Well, because things are awfully similar here for an object that's falling towards this, some big object like the Earth, or maybe trying to go up through the gravitational of some big object like the Earth. So let's imagine that some big object like the Earth is down here. And let's, for our, to make our lives convenient, let's make that y equals zero. So then, if I throw something upwards, then it's going to go up to, as it goes up to some new height, gravity is tugging downwards on it. But now it's a much more complicated situation. It's not just mg in the downward direction. It's whatever this mass is down here, capital M. Then we've got big G, which is univer Newton's universal constant of gravitation. Then you've got little m, which is whatever this mass that you're throwing is. Okay, and then you've got the distance between them. Well, thanks to the fact that I chose y equals zero as at the center of this big mass down here, the distance between them is just y, and the distance between them is supposed to be squared. So basically, that just means you put y squared in the denominator. And once again, this is in the downward direction. So that means that if I have a particle going upwards, let's call this the ith chunk right here, the ith chunk of a little bit of change in y. If I have this thing going upwards, then the amount of work done as I go from here to here is whatever the height is of that little chunk, times whatever this is evaluated in this zone. And of course, that's g m m over y sub i squared. 
And of course, if I make this chunk sufficiently small, then this thing here, this prefactor, isn't varying much as I go from there to there. So there it is, except I don't have the sign right yet. Once again, as I go up, that is if delta yi is positive, since the force is going uh, down, the work done here is, the work done, the little i bit of work done, has got a minus sign here. Now let's uh, sum all those up. If we bust this chunk up into chunks numbered from 0 to n minus 1, then we have sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 of, well, we got that minus sign there. So we have minus g m m over y i squared times delta y i. And that is the total amount of work done as you go from y initial to y final. Don't confuse that i there, which is just an index i, with that i there, which just means initial. Okay, so the total amount of work done is that. Now, I've argued enough times at this point that, you, that this is the Riemann sum, and it turns into an integral and the limit that delta y i goes to 0. And what integral is it? You don't need to know this integral yet if you don't know integrals yet. I'll just tell you, though, if you do know integrals, this is the integral from y initial to y final dy of minus g m m over y squared. That integral is not a hard integral to do. The integral of minus 1 over y squared dy, thanks to that minus sign there, <laughs> is uh, takes care of one other minus sign that you would might usually get uh, is equal to the um, g m m over y. So I've got that evaluated from y initial to y final. So the work done is g m m over y final minus g m m over y initial. I'm going to uh, summarize that. Now, as usual, we would love it if we could choose a potential such that W was equal to minus the change in the potential. In other words, minus U final minus U initial. Now, that's actually not that hard at all. If we sort of identify minus U final with that and plus U initial with that, we see that a function for which this works is u of y is equal to minus g capital M little m over y. That works. Actually, so does any other function that is like this plus any old constant. So you, if you added any old constant here, like 277 joules, then this would also work because all we really demand is that u final minus u initial agree with that. And of course, adding a constant to u, the constant is going to drop out of the difference. But anyway, usually people don't put any constant on this thing. They just say the gravitational potential energy as a function of y is minus gmm over y which means it gets more and more and more negative as you get closer and closer and closer to the object, right? Because if I get closer and closer, y is getting smaller and smaller, but I got a minus sign out here. Now, if you go look at Knight equation 13.15, this is what he wrote. But I wrote u of y is equal to minus g m m over y. Why do we seem to have something slightly different? Well, I only paid attention to what happens if I call this the y direction and I go along in that direction. But uh, Knight, of course, points out that no matter what direction I go from this mass here, I could go off this way or I could go off that way. But no matter what direction I go, the force goes as g m m over r squared. And I just happened to choose the y-axis as the direction I was going. So this formula here that Knight has, this takes care of the fact that you might want to go any direction. Here we have a big mass and a little mass. And let's suppose this big mass is so large that I don't have to worry about its motion. 
And meanwhile, I have this little mass that's going around this big mass. Uh, so this, you know, might be a satellite. And what equations do we have at our disposal? Well, we know that the force between them is GMM over R squared. And we're looking for a solution where things go around in a circle. Now, if this thing's going around in a circle, we know that the acceleration is this. A is equal to minus V squared over R times R hat. And actually, this attractive force, if I write it as a vector, F, the force on this little guy right here, is minus GM M over R squared times R hat. They both point in the radial direction, the acceleration and the force. They both point inward, that's good. And so there's the possibility that circular motion can be maintained just by the force of gravity. Well, if we're gonna make these two work, they better have the F equals MA. And we already argued that the uh, direction, including the sign, works. So we just have to multiply m times this thing and set that equal to this thing. So we have m times v squared over r is equal to gmm over r squared. Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, m drops out. So that means it doesn't matter how heavy or light your satellite is, it can follow the same orbit. M drops out, one of the R's can go away. And I suppose you could take the square root of both sides if you were solving for V, in which case you'd have V is equal to the square root of GM over R. Now that's not a very famous formula. Let me show you a famous formula. A long, long time ago, before even Newton, Kepler had observed this, that for every planet, you looked at its orbital period, like for Earth, that's 365 days. You look at its orbital period and you square that, that was always equal to the radius of the orbit cubed. You know, which for the Earth is 150 million kilometers. So, 300, somehow 365 days was always equal to, and it, it wasn't just t squared was a cubed, there was some constant here. But that constant was the same for every planet in the solar system. And so the formula that Kepler had was that t squared is proportional to a cubed. Let's see if we can get that formula. We know that v is the square root of gm over r. Well, we need a, first we need a formula for capital T, how long it takes the planet to go around the sun. Well, how far long it takes a planet to go around the sun is how far its path around the sun is, and that's 2 pi r divided by its speed, which is v. 2 pi r over v, well, we know what v is now already. v is square root of gm over r. So what we're learning here is that we're getting a formula for the period, and it says that uh, capital T is equal to 2 pi r over v is equal to 2 pi r over square root of gm over r. That doesn't quite like look like Kepler's formula yet, but square both sides of this formula, and now you have t squared is equal to 4 pi squared r squared over square root of gm over r squared. Well, that's gm over r. Okay, but now I've got an r in the denominator of the denominator, which comes up and combines with this r squared that's already in the numerator and makes an r cubed. So we've just proven that t squared is proportional to r cubed where r is the radius from the sun to the planet. And sure enough, it doesn't depend on the planet's mass. It only depends on the sun's mass. And of course, that doesn't change from planet to planet. So what we've shown is exactly what Kepler observed, which is that the period squared of a planet is proportional to its radius cubed, and the proportionality factor 
for this to have any significance is independent of which planet you're talking about. And there it is. It's 4 pi squared over capital G, capital M. Okay, so now we've proven uh, 1322 and 1325. And the only other thing I want to show you, because this section was talked about satellite orbits and energies, let's talk about uh, how the kinetic energy of an object and how its potential energy vary as a function of, of radius. Okay, so we have that formula that V is equal to the square root of GM over R, which basically says the, the farther and farther away from you get from the sun, actually, the f slower and slower you go. Or if it's a satellite orbiting the Earth, the farther and farther away the satellite orbits the Earth, the slower and slower it goes. Interesting. Its speed picks up as it gets closer and closer. Let's look at its kinetic energy then. Its kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, or this is a little m, v squared. That's 1 half times m, and now v squared is gm over r. Let's compare that with its potential energy. u is equal to, all right, well, we just got to plug in there. That's minus gmm over r. So that's minus gmm over r. So the main remaining observation that Knight wants you to have in this chapter is that kinetic energy and potential energy have almost all the same factors. They have a G. They have a big M. They have a little m. They have an R. Okay? The only thing they disagree by is that the U has a minus 1 in front of it, and the K has a plus a half in front of it. So as you get closer and closer to the sun while maintaining a circular orbit, let's like let's say you're Mercury, you're the closest planet to the sun, you'll have the most kinetic energy and you'll have even more negative potential energy. And how much more? It's uh whatever the kinetic energy is, it's twice as much with a minus sign. The way Knight put it was that K is equal to minus a half U. Well, that's the end of uh, mini lecture number 36.